Aloha and welcome back to Talk Story with John Waihei on Think Tech Hawaii. Uh, we are thank you to our viewers. Because of you, we are having a part two of the show we had last week, which was dealing with heroes, rescues, rascals, and duds. And here we are again. We got a, another interesting evening for you. And with that, the moderator for this afternoon is going to be Colin Moore again, the uh, director, I guess, of public policy at the University of Hawaii which is a kind of interesting title, especially relating to the University of Hawaii, but that's uh, maybe another show. We have Richard Bereka, the Dean of Political Commentators in the State of Hawaii. He's been around long enough to earn the title. And we have with us Chuck Friedman, who was the, uh, uh, I guess he's a communications policy guru or some some sort of, of that. So here we are for ordinary people talking about the people who made contemporary Hawaii. With that, Colin, the show is yours. All right. Thank you, Governor, for this chance to have an encore performance for all of us here. Um, we got so many responses, so many people that names that were suggested to us that we didn't have a, a time to get to on the last show. So we're going to try to start at the beginning, actually. We decided that's the only way we can really keep a handle on this and move forward. And with that, we're going to start at the very beginning with William Quinn, who was the last territorial governor and the first governor of the state of Hawaii. And Richard, I know you, you had a, a story about, uh, about Bill Quinn, and, I, and let's just start there. What were your reactions? When did you meet him? Well, I... Uh... Actually, it was an un unhappy day for him because he had just uh, been told he was leaving as the president of Dole Company. He had uh, had his time in, in the office as, as the first governor of, of Hawaii. Uh, he was a Republican. Um, and uh, when I met him, I had to go over to the Dole Company, uh, Dole Plant uh, Pineapple Company office, and he was very cordial to talk about what he'd done and, and what had happened. Uh, and I really didn't get a chance to talk a lot about him uh, and his history as a governor. Uh, he, he was uh, the first governor. He was a Republican. Um, because before that he had been appointed by, uh, I believe it was Eisenhower as, a, as the, the, the last appointed governor and then the first one to win in an election. Um, he was not able to carry on for a second term. He got into a lot of fights with his lieutenant governor and uh, <laughs> it, just, it just never worked out. Um, and that it's something yeah. that. That happens, and uh, it's a good lesson to at least. Yeah, he was the uh, he was the first governor that got challenged by his lieutenant governor, <laughs> and it's the first time that the first governor in the state of Hawaii, Jimmy Kealoha. Remember, good old Jimmy Kealoha. He was the mayor of the Big Island, and uh, it was a really interesting character because they divided the party, and not only did they, they divide it, they made it possible that fight between the two of them made it possible for. Uh, Burn to get elected. Mm -hmm. What I remember about Quinn was that he used to campaign. I, I remember I was uh, in intermediate school and he was campaigning. Uh, I think it was uh, what he called secondary or something. And he used to sing uh, Danny Boy. And so he was singing Danny Boy before Inoy sang Danny Boy. And he, and, he, and he would go up there and he would sing Danny Boy. And, and, and everybody used to sing in those days, which means I'd never have gotten to do that. Myself. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Danny Boy, Jimmy Kaloha, what a, oh, Quinn. He lost the election. He did something. He, he wanted to solve the housing problem in Hawaii. And he created something called the second Mahele. And his idea of solving how the housing crisis in Hawaii was to give a homestead out state land, except calling his, that program the second Mahele upset Jimmy Kealoha, 
and caused them the election. It's, a, it's always been a loaded word to start talking about this is the great Mahele, this is not the great Mahele. Best to stay away from that. <laughs> yeah. So that takes us into Burns, I guess, huh? That's right. It takes us into Burns and, and you know, another Republican, since we were just talking about a Republican, is Hiram Fong, too. Um, so, but let's start with Burns. Um, Richard, Chuck? You know, he, uh, I, I knew Burns as, as the governor. I was at the University of Hawaii going to school, and I remember uh, with the Kaleo, we interviewed him on of what? Of course, uh, housing. The housing. This was the student housing crisis at the time. Bachman Hall would, had just happened. The big uh, invasion of Bachman Hall, and then after that, they were it was a sit-in out in the in the in the lawn for a week at Bachman Hall, and Burns was going to uh, attempt to solve it. He didn't solve it, but he met with the students. But Burns was a strange politician. I don't think they make them like him anymore. I remember him at, uh, sitting on uh, the podium at uh, a big speech at the state capitol and not once ever saying uh, hello to the audience or actually even greeting the audience there. So it was, he was, he could just care about what he was going to talk about and that was it and didn't really have to make any friends to do it what what do you think allowed him to get away with that uh, he, you know he he was also called uh not to his face but the great white father because he had helped organize uh the new democratic party and from the time during World War II uh, and had so much, so many people had aloha for him for what he had done regarding uh, um, Japanese Americans and World War II and, and, and the problems that were ensuing there. Uh, so he, he was able to uh, walk across many different lines that way. You know, you couldn't talk about Burns, though, without bringing up his nemesis, which was Todd I, Gill. Exactly. That's just where I was going to go. Uh -huh. Yeah. And Tom, Tom Gill was sort of, I guess he was the progressive of that day, you know. And he was, it was a strange, it was a strange Democratic Party because you had all these characters in it. And uh, Gill was, uh, I, when, <laughs> when I was entering politics, you know, Burns was the, uh, it's, I didn't know Burns. You know, and uh, so we called him the great stone face, Richard. You know, those of us on the <laughs> Gill side of the ledger. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, the trouble, Gill's exec was uh, very intellectual. In fact, I, he used to give these speeches and he, and he was so cerebral, uh, cerebral sometimes that uh, most people, you know, couldn't relate to him any more than they could relate to a guy who didn't go around shaking hands. <laughs> this is strange. I mean, well, I recall he was ahead of his time. Gill would start a, out his campaign speech by insulting everyone for being dumb enough to come to his speech and paying <laughs> money to do it. So I said, you know, he's probably not going to do too well. Well, he did as well as he could. Um, <laughs> he, there was a a cynical humor to uh, Tom Gill's speeches. That uh, he was uh, funny. He, uh, he was very funny, actually. I think that the difference between Tom Gill and and Governor Burns in terms of how they were successful is that Burns had these remarkable people behind him and around him who were working for him all the time. What Tom Gill had was sort of the intelligentsia, which is sporadic in how much they help you. But Burns had coalesced uh, uh, the American Japanese population and, and uh, anybody who had a civil injustice against them. People like Mike Tokunaga came back from the war and, and would work from the back of the room every single day that John Burns was, had to do anything. And then after that, George Ariyoshi. And, and it was people like Tokunaga who 
really carried the ball for for these leaders and and spread the word and and did the kind of grassroots work that uh, that liberal intellectuals could never accomplish. By the way, that split that split between Gill and and our and and Burns, the sort of a liberal intellectual and the more hardcore populist, uh, it stayed in the party for a decade after after Burns and Gill were gone. Let it's, me it's, ask you. It, it's interesting though that um, in, well, in addition to guys like Mike Tokunaga, you had uh, like the Dan Aoki and all these uh, 442 guys. But uh, and I remember seeing, you know, being in one of the early Democratic Party conventions, and we'd be there. We're the Gillites, you know, we're the people that are making noise and so forth. And uh, having Dan Aoki walk, uh, and we take a vote, and they, we are the majority in the room. And then Dan Aoki would walk in and dump a bunch of, uh, you know, votes on, on paper. What do you call those? And, and and they would win. <laughs> I mean, it was like, who, 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 you know, where's the democracy in this? But it was a very fun time. L let me ask you about another uh, behind the scenes person who, my understanding, it was very significant in in. Uh, uh, Burns's win in that 1970 race, which is Bob Oshiro. Well, Bob Oshiro is one of the people I I picked as a hero, mm -hmm. and and uh, he was a campaign strategist for Burns, and then more for Ariyoshi, and then for John Whitehay. They called him the Wizard of Wahiwa. He built organizations and grassroots across the state, uh, a network that was iron willed. Uh, Oshiro had a way of be almost a, a self-acclaimed martyr. He would push the campaign and push the campaign, but nobody was ever working harder than Bob Oshiro. When when George Ariyoshi was behind uh, in, in his uh, primary election, uh, in walked Bob, and he said to the troops, he said, we have to do the big thing. We have to fill up Aloha Stadium. 50,000 people are gonna come with a few days to go before the election. And, and there was anti Momi. Min and there was Sister Correa, and they were going, Yeah, and we are going to make 50,000 bentos to do it. And I mean, that was the kind of guy he was, and, but he was a genius. And, and, the, and, and he, uh, well, I could tell you a lot of stories about Bob Oshiro, but, uh, but he, you know, we, we, there were some amazing legislators during that time as well. And they saw the split, and, and so did the party. I mean, so did the party. They were always this kind of the Gill-Burns uh, factions in the party. But when the chips were down and it was against the Republicans, people came together. But you know, some of the interesting legislators of that time was uh, people like Nadal Yoshinaga. You know, I mean, Nacho probably was um, one of the people really responsible for much of the progressive legislation that Hawaii passed in those days. Uh, he was probably, he, when he was Ways and Means Chairman in the state Senate, he's the only Ways and Means Chairman that ever sent the budget back to the University of Hawaii and demanded that they increase the amount that they were asking. I mean, this is the kind of people that, that, that existed. And then uh, he also in 1962, uh, ran for Congress ostensibly. He really wasn't, but he ran as an anti-Vietnam War candidate. And, and so he got all these young people. And then he, the same uh, effort that Richard was describing, where there was a sit-in at the University of Hawaii, he got, um, he, he, he got all the young people to come and see him at the legislature and then started hiring people like David Hagino and a bunch of others that, that are still, you know, rebel route today. But he brought them in and sort of adopted them. And, you know, he's, uh, just so we can keep naming notorious person, his first committee clerk was a guy named Harold Matsumoto, which uh, got to be infamous as his life went on. But anyway, these are, and I, 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 Richard, you know Alma Cavalli. Nadal, Nadal uh... He, he was a uh, power in his own right and was able to do amazing things with legislation. I remember once he had the budget all wrapped up and then he, he also wanted to put in 
uh, a tax bill. There was an, an increase to the excise tax bill, and he refused. He signed, I do not concur on the budget bill that he had drafted just so they could throw it into chaos and he would have another chance to get at it and get the uh, Jack Birds wanted uh, excise tax increase in. It was a chaotic two days and nights at the legislature for that, uh, that session. It was back in the 70s. But it was all uh, Nadal's uh, chess mastery that, that put that off. I mean, how do you have the committee chairman signing, signing I do not concur on the ways and means uh, legislation, but he was able to do that. You know, one other thing that I wanted to say ab about uh, Najo that people don't appreciate today was that he was a tremendous creator of other politicians. He sponsored so many people uh, in the legislature or recruited people just uh, almost from the street where he said, why don't you run? Why don't you run for office? If you run, I'll help you, you know. Uh, and he, he would do that. He, he was a, an iconoclast that way because they weren't people you would think that uh, were going to be typical. They weren't 442 members. They weren't those kind of guys or women. Uh, but he, he did have a great interest in, in building the Democratic Party that way that you, uh, other, other parts of the party could learn from. And on the House side, you had somebody like Elmo Cavallo. You remember Elmer? I mean, I'm sure Richard and Chuck. Actually, I don't. I, I never. I never covered uh, Cravalho, so that's one one oh. part you're going to have to handle that one. Do you? Did you know Elmer uh, Chuck? Yeah, somewhat. Uh, and, uh, somewhat, and and he um, he was chair of the Democratic Party for a while too. Uh, he, he he was crafty. I didn't really know him personally, though. Governor, maybe I, I tell you what I tell you one of the things he, he well he was another very strong legislator and, and, and leader but one of the more interesting things that I don't know very many people know is that when the protect Kaho Olavi Ohana were were protesting the bombing of Kaho Olavi and uh, and, and and when in the in the early beginnings that they, they were looked upon as sort of a sort of a radical you know, group out there somewhere. And all of a sudden, one of the military bombs fell on uh, <laughs> Alma Cavallo's backyard. And you mentioned that mm -hmm. dude, somebody screwed up. This is all in, and Alma became a, a member of the Protect Kaho Olavi Ohana. And all of a sudden, he, he was gathering politicians and everything was going on. It was a really interesting time. He was the mayor of Maui and somehow living in, I think it was Kihei, and they, they made a mistake and dropped the, it, was, it didn't explode, it was a dud, but nevertheless, it fell into the bay. So yeah. it, it, it was some interesting time, the 70s, uh, 60s and 70s, real character. Let me, let me ask you about another very famous case that happened at this time around Vietnam, which is the Tom Hamilton, president of the University of Hawaii and the Oliver Lee tenure case. I know that had ramifications that went well beyond the university. Did uh, do you recall the effect, the long-term effects of that? You know, uh, I think that, that Oliver, Oliver Lee and the protests at the University of Hawaii were at, at that time, uh, front page news for at least six months and then a year and then ongoing and ongoing and they go to court, they get arrested, they come out. Uh, the, the university was much more liable, lively in, in time, terms of protests and demonstrations then. Uh, and Tom Hamilton had to do a, a really yeoman's job trying to hold all the sides together because at the same time, the university was just starting to take off as a uh, major academic center, not just for Hawaii, not just for the state, but for the whole Pacific Basin. It's, it's, now it's an important institution across the entire Pacific. And it was, it was just back in the, in the late 60s and 70s that, that that started. And the Oliver Lee controversies that were uh, about 
who exactly was going to control the University of Hawaii were, were there. And it was because of whether or not Oliver Lee, who was a, um, a uh, like, I'm not sure it was card carrying, but he was a fervent communist at the time and uh, was preaching uh, something that a certain amount of uh, students cared for, but uh, the faculty had a hard time endorsing that kind of thing. So it was, it was a difficult time, but also very controversial. Which leads yeah. us to, uh, if I might, uh, uh, the, the late 60s and the 70s, what was going on at, at the University of Hawaii. And one of the real great heroes of Hawaii, I think of contemporary high of, of all time. And that was uh, Richard Kosaki mm -hmm. and his wife, Mildred, and the effort to go from just uh, trade and vocational schools to community colleges. This was a drive that Richard led uh, later on, uh, Joyce Sunoda, famous uh, people in Hawaii educational circles who opened up the doors and created not just workforce training, but, but the, to look at the future and shape what kind of manpower, people power was going to be needed and address it. And uh, Richard and Mildred were extraordinary leaders and thinkers. As uh, Governor Waihei knows, they were, uh, they, he was also an expert on Asian Pacific affairs and helped to found the East-West Center. So during that period of foment, there was this quiet guy, uh, AJA fellow who was actually born and raised in Waikiki, you know, around the Waikiki area, who took Hawaii to extraordinary places. Today, there are something like 30,000 people every day that are benefiting from the community college services. And, and Governor, he was a, a favorite of yours, was he not? Oh, yes, yeah, sure he was. And, and you know, and yeah. <laughs> uh, it, and I think you you put you went pretty clear there. I, the university actually spun off a lot of things because talking about see Richard was uh, Kosaki was sort of the it gave a lot of intellectual credence to some of the protests and some of the things going on, as well as he he was working inside. But you know the protests on the Oliver Lee and the war also led to protests against Kalama Valley. And and the uh, the developments that were happening in, in, around the state at that time, it led to the uh, uh, the, the Waiholi Waikani, all all the land movement started in, in it, and it led to something called Our History, Our Way, which was uh, I remember the uh, you should see some of the bank vice presidents today that uh, well they're retired now who were uh, uh, involved with this Kokua Hawaii and, uh, you know, ethnic history uh, uh, politics. And uh, it's, it's funny, it's just amazing. But the University of Hawaii did all of that, you know? And, and we get to the, on the political side, what's interesting is that also feeds into the political side. Now, when Ariyoshi becomes governor, the opposition to Ariyoshi within the party continues to build a, be the Gillite. You know, Richard Wong, uh, Dicky Wong, Ben Caetano, Neil Abercrombie were all on the other side of the uh, political spectrum. And you had then the, the more stable people on, on, on one side. But both, both political factions were very much um, attuned to using the intellectual power that they found at the university. Whether it was Dick Kosaki, who did a lot, Yukio Naito, who, nice. is, it, it, you know, who, who essentially drafted the uh, workers' compensation type legislation. Joan Hayes, I think it was Joan Hayes. Joan Hayes was the, probably the mother of the uh, right, the choice, right. Uh, choice bill uh, to abortion. They're all coming out of this intellectual milieu that as we're building this great university. I mean, the 70s and the 80s, really, maybe up to the 90s, but especially the 70s, was a very stimulating, intellectually stimulating time in Hawaii. I mean, we weren't, there was, I, I think that's the best, the time when we most saw what they call cloak and gown sort of pulling 
together. And, and I think the, I think the what what we what we saw in in the seventies was and it was almost biblical in the the fight that went on between the Gill people and the Burns people. You can almost uh maybe now it's finally gone on to two different different things it may be uh uh different maybe a sovereignty issue maybe as as fiercely held uh as but the burns burns gill factions were uh, as you mentioned governor was just something that people kept saying yes that's that's it. Well, that's a person's a Burns person. Now, that person's a Gill person. I mean, it was a way you classified uh, people totally. But, you know, Hawaii had a way of, of mixing things up, even back then. I mean, one of the Gill people that I knew very well was Alvin Shim. I think uh, we might, some of the people out there might know Mona Shim, who unfortunately just mm -hmm. passed away. His, his dad, Alvin Shim, was. Uh, very big labor leader, and uh, and but he was a, a Gill person, and, um, and and the unions were also sort of split between Gill and Burns and so forth. But what was interesting was that Alvin not only had as a law partner Tom Gill, he also had as a law partner David McClung, who was mm -hmm. a very strong Burns backer. So you know Hawaii is was a small place, but that shouldn't, I, I think it, it shouldn't uh, lessen the fact that these people have, have very strong beliefs and they carried their politics on. Burns was probably closer, closer to uh, what we used to call uh, Bishop Street. I don't know, you know. And uh, Gill may have been a little bit closer to the University of Hawaii. They both split the union. Mm -hmm. Well, the big it, it, it used to be the big div divide in, in in the unions was uh, where the ILWU was going. That was the union of all all power at the at the time in in the in the seventies, probably sixties and, and seventies. Uh, and the ILWU made uh, members of the legislature or would uh, totally ignore them, and that would the end of them but that was the, the major major union at the time one, one of the interesting things about the ilwu during many many years is that they never as a union made political contribution they never gave politicians money what they gave politicians which was even more frightening was manpower and they would work and and they would get people elected now what happened in the 70s that kind of brought things maybe a little bit farther down the road was in the 19, early 1970s, Hawaii recognized public workers and, uh, and uh, started signing contracts. So the HGA, UPW, in fact, the teachers union, uh, the teachers union had a strike very early. In, and so here we are in a blue state and a union state and I remember around 72, 73, there was a, there was a teacher strike in Hawaii. Uh, and the teachers union was, there was a fight between two different unions, uh, the AFL-CIO union, and then the, uh, I, I don't remember what it was, but it was two different unions. And all of that created another bunch of union leaders who started to rival the ILWU, which is the HGEA, UPW. And we start getting into people like David Trapp, who, uh, you know, countering his his uh, cousin, who was uh, Tommy Trask at the ILWU. Mm -hmm. I mean, was Richard, you, you were in the thick of all that. So collective bargaining uh, is such a taken for granted uh, piece of uh, political and labor uh, history in, in in Hawaii, but compared to so many states on the mainland, it's unheard of. So when I talk to uh, friends on the mainland and uh, involved in politics, and I talk about the unions in Hawaii and the right and power of public workers in, in uh, unions, uh, 
uh, a lot of people in you know states states like Texas or Missouri or more conservative places they don't understand it at all it doesn't it doesn't at all equate with their understanding of political power structures so it's an interesting it's an interesting faction that hawaii has that's different from other places how, how did how did folks at the federal level do you think affected state level politics i mean i will just ask you about two big figures we've never mentioned of course danny noe spark matsunaga what role did they play in state level politics uh, obviously, Danny Noy was a, a huge figure in all this. Spark Matsunaga was well respected, but he wasn't uh, politically really all that powerful. But as as the Gill and, and Ariyoshi combats kind of waned and there was a little bit of a power vacuum, in stepped Danny Noe and full blast. And he, he, people who know how the way you know, he worked, he had lots of circles of friends. He had maybe hundreds of circles of friends with the very, very closest people being in the first circle, but everybody thought they were part of the gang. And Inoue had specific plans that he thought federally should be applied to each of the counties. And he moved in with, you know, the notion that power is a neutral term and it's how you use it that's good or bad, and he was going to use it for good. Um, and he did. Uh, he he uh, he didn't do so well when he got involved with the little po local political affairs. He got his toes burned a few times on that, but he stayed big and got more and more powerful with time. And he, um, I mean, and his inner circle of friends were included uh, Walter Dodds, uh, in particular Jeff Watanabe. Walter, of course, was the uh, chairman and CEO of First Hawaiian. Jeff Watanabe, a, a powerful lawyer in town. They were the guys who were in the inside circle, and they could do a lot on the pub in the public and private sectors to make things happen. I, I don't want to make it sound too clandestine. I think what Dan and these guys did was mostly good, uh, but it was a it was its own power block, and it operated differently than than the old Oshiro Ariyoshi Burns thing. Um, it, it had to do more with the circles it created, and and getting things done than it did with with political races, uh, very, very different. Yeah, I think I think that what, what Danny, which I, I don't think maybe, uh, you know, historians don't appreciate as much is how proud, uh, you know, uh, uh, Danny Noy at various times made people in Hawaii. And, uh, and, and as the years, as the years went on, he did get stronger stronger i mean he you know he's obviously a lot more powerful in 1990 than uh, or in 2000 than he was in, in uh, 1970 right. but in in 19 uh, 1968 i remember being on the mainland uh, trying to be uh, go you know see the, the crowds in chicago at the chicago democratic convention without actually getting involved you know it was exciting for a boy from hawaii to just be there and then all of a sudden, Inouye gets on the stage, and he gives this fantastic, uh, in my opinion, speech. And uh, what I wanted to do was run all over Chicago, telling everybody, "That's my Senate. That's my Senate." You know. And then, uh, yeah, I mean, the only other time I started acting that crazy was when Hawaii had a basketball team called the Fabulous Five, <laughs> and they were starting to win foot a uh, basketball game against top rated mainland team. And it was, it's exciting. And then to watch Danny Noy very calmly uh, adjudicate, lead the commission on Watergate with, every with, day. And he won, he won over, he won over an entire generation with three words, what a liar. Okay. You know, so when, this when, is when what he did. When or Ehrlichman was, uh, up there and of course uh, he was giving the the, the nixon spoof and uh you know i pretended that, that the, he thought the mic was dead he put his hand to the shield and he went what a liar and he won over an entire generation of americans who said who is you know who's that guy he's i want to be like that guy and, and, and none of this is to you know depreciate sparky 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 was a very interesting uh, character himself because what Sparky used to do was anybody from Hawaii mm -hmm. 
that popped up in Washington. He would take them to lunch. And then you get to eat uh, this Navy bean soup that they were cooking in, in the Senate uh, cafeteria. <laughs> three, three for like lunches a day, years. I understand that uh, Sparky would hold. Yeah, and, and you know, again, what, what do you do? Lunch would be three, three different lunches he would go to. It, it was amazing. Uh, my uncle, you know, there's guys from the, uh, from the just ordinary people on saving up to go to Washington, D.C. on some kind of tour. And then he get, they get invited to go have uh, lunch with Sparky at the Capitol. And, and you know, they, they would vote for him every time. I mean, he may not have been as electric as Inouye, but believe me, he was just as popular with the local uh, populace. And, he was also very, he, he was very, he was very good inside. Patsy Mink, who, who once told me of all those men out there, and she was including Inoue and Burns and all of them, of all those, and she had run against Sparky and lost. Of all mm -hmm. those men out there, the one that's a real gentleman, a good heart, is Sparky Matsunaga. And I, and I think that came across with everybody who met him. He was eminently decent and, and very local. Yeah, and, and you know, and turning back home, I, I don't know, talking about ladies who might be interesting, coming out of the Gill faction and, but, and, and surviving was a young lieutenant governor named Gene King. And, and a state and a senator, you know, and uh, Chuck. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, Chuck worked for her. <laughs> Chuck was plucked from the, I won't tell my story too much, except to say that myself and a guy named Lloyd Nakova, who had helped Gene run on the Big Island for lieutenant governor, uh, both got phone calls, much to our surprise. I had no thought of leaving Hilo from Gene King when she got first got elected and said, I need a couple of young, bright guys to come down here. And I wondered why she was calling us, especially Lloyd. But anyway, uh, yeah, we both came down to work for Jean and did for four years. And she was a, 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 a really classic lady who unfortunately just could not stand, uh, you know, working for, uh, for Governor Ayoshi. Uh, that's a whole nother thing. And so she ran against him and lost. Jean, Jean but she King, was. I, could, I would say that Jean, Jean King could give. Uh, class lessons, college lessons on how to take the lieutenant governorship and make it into a important thing. She would take the being LG and bring it bring it to the dinner table almost. Yeah. I mean she was yeah. so able to forget about the intellectual side of, of what are you going to do with the codifying the laws and stuff like that, that the lieutenant governor does. She was able to make it really a living, breathing uh, office. And it, people should study that. People who are now going to be lieutenant governor in the future should take a lesson from how Gene King did that. We ran, we ran weekly brown bag lunches where anybody could come in, sit down and talk about whatever they wanted for an hour and a half with her. Um, and and she was sort of like I don't know Dick Cabot. Yeah, she could just run the whole thing. She was a, a, both a, a spiritually and physically a beautiful person. And, and well, she succeeded uh, a, 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 a senator and a judge from the Big Island called Nelson Doy, who was another Gill person. You see, there's this kind of thing. Ariyoshi's up there as governor, and then he. All these lieutenant governors are guilt, uh, sort of guilt people. And uh, Nelson had a real here, and then he just disappeared. He ran for, I think, for, he ran against Frank Mayor. 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 Yeah, he, uh, of course, we, we talked about Bossy, but, you know, Bossy was special. Well, you remember Nelson. what Nelson Doy said about, about Frank, right? That he was a pathological liar. <laughs> <laughs> that, Nelson was a great speaker, by the way. He was a great stump speaker. I saw him on the Big Island when I lived there. Yeah, um, he, he was a, he was a short man, but a sturdy man, and he could get up there and belt one out, you know, like Ethel Merman. He was a terrific speaker, and and a proud local Okinawan. You know, uh, all of this uh, sort of takes place all simultaneously with uh, all the people in Hawaii meeting at the Constitutional Convention. And one of the great people at the convention, I think, was, uh, was Bill Beatty. Mm -hmm. 
And one of the more interesting things about Bill Beatty was that Bill Beatty was the antithesis of anything that I thought politically Democrats should stand for. You know, he was the plantation manager. He was comma, uh, you know, the, the guy who could live in the white, at the big white house when everybody else lived in plantation camps. And he turned out to be one of the great gentlemen of Hawaii. I have to tell you, I, personally, personally, I, I love the guy. Yeah. And, but we started out by completely, uh, by me opposing everything that he was doing. And, uh, but, you know. How did he win you over? Um, I, you know, he just by being himself and, 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 you know, and then he was president of the CONCON and obviously I was a delegate, but he also won me over by spending time letting us know that business may not be all bad, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that, you know, you didn't always have to have a red book in your left hand and, 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 your, and, and nothing in your right, you know, you, you could kind of balance the whole thing. But he was a real, a real proven hero from World War II, and he was a natural gentleman, um, and and it was he was just connected from the get go, and he chaired governor, he chaired John Y. Hayes' first campaign for to run for governor, and I'll tell you a story that when the when the Honolulu Advertiser with about six weeks to go came out with a Jerry Keir poll that had Governor Y. Hayes thirty six points behind. Uh, C. Septel and and uh, Patsy Mink even further behind. Uh, I, I, we had to do something that day, the day that poll came out, and Bill Patey decided what we should do is hold a press conference down at, at the headquarters, and we would have a hibachi there, and he would take the poll and roll it into little balls and say, "This is what this poll is good for," and light it up and start the hibachi. And I, I, you know, I didn't know that. I didn't oh know yeah, that. It, it was on television. It was really cool. And the, the thing, John, that was really remarkable is after that, I mean, I think because people thought the advertiser was just against you. If you had 50 people at your headquarters that first night after the poll, there were 100 the second night and 200 the third night. But somehow Bill and you and others, Oshiro, were able to turn this sense of there's somebody against us into, into a, an electrifying experience for everybody. You know, there was a kind of a, a group of these Kamaaina type, uh, uh, Bill Patey, Fred Trotter, Fred. Dudley Pratt. There was a number, there was a cadre of... Uh, Henry people, Walker. Henry Walker in the business world, all of who were Kamaaina. And in some sense, you know, the heirs of the, uh, <laughs> of the overthrow. Luna. Why were they, why were they uh, genial as they might have been? Why were they then able to affect legislation uh, at the um, legislature, but unable to then go on and talk and not be able to uh, uh, make, make the Republicans any sort of power in in the state of Hawaii? Well, I, I think for one thing, a, a lot of them got rid of their Republican card. <laughs> you, you know, especially in the 1980s and, and so forth. Prior to that, as you remember, uh, Republicans for a long time, even after the Democrats got the majority in the legislature, Republicans uh, remained politically viable. Uh, they they had a good portion of the you know they had enough members in in the in the House and in the Senate to make a difference. I mean that's why Dickie Wong was able, for example, to make a coalition and essentially with five Democrats run the the, the Senate. But after a while, um, they just started uh, moving over. You know Hiram Fong. I'm, I'm trying to think. Hiram Fong was the first, uh, was one of our first senators. senators. He had, uh, yeah. Or, or there was another, the other senator was this guy named Orrin Long, who was a, appointed governor. But Hiram Fong was able to take the, become a Republican who all the union endorsed. But more importantly, I think the, the, the issues that uh, the Republicans had, they were very, 
you know, local. I mean, they they were Hawaii first people. So in that sense, there was a kind of a, a coalition building. But as the years went on, they just sort of their party sort of drifted away from them. Uh, you know, one person, if we're going to talk about Republicans, who I think is uh, one of the most underrated heroes in Hawaii, in a sense, is Pat Psyche. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, she 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 um, was. And she never gets enough credit for this, but she was the person who actually talked George Bush into stopping the bombing of Kahu Olavi. Correct. It was after that had actually happened that the that the Congress passed the bill to you know uh, permanize it. But it was it was Pat it was Pat Psyche who did that and. She, you know, and then you had you had Republicans, well, people who played with the Republican Party, I think, like like Frank Fossey. Frank Fossey moved parties, uh, but he nobody actually considered him anything but Frank Fossey. Richard, I just want to say one thing about the what what happened with business and the Republicans. I I I think if you look at that 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 business oligarchy that sort of existed after the big five, uh, but was still around in the 60s and 70s. I think that oligarchy, the wheels were starting to wobble on that thing just systemically. At the same time, the Democrats were coming into power, Democrats like like Burns Ariyoshi and Y. Hay. And most of these business guys, though they, they weren't really strong Republicans, they leaned, they had Republican inclinations, but they found that they could get some of what they wanted to get done with the local Democratic leaders you know, sort of individually as opposed to a unit, and well, and, I, and they, they fell into that. I, I think I, I think that they were a little bit co-opted by by Democratic leadership, but also the power of business w- was lost somewhere around 1970, as far as there being one unit. It was becoming an international uh, operation, and you just didn't have this big, except for Walter Dodds and a few others. You didn't have the real strong leadership. That's right. You know, it, was, it, it seems to me that it was the power was completely diluted, especially when all the hotels were owned by uh, mainland and, or, or international uh, groups. There was no real uh, local business control of, of Hawaii, and, and uh, the, Re- the Republicans locally were unable to tap any other source. It was, it's an interesting thing because at the the Republicans now, what are left, to keep saying that? Well, you know, it, it's a, it's all because it's the fault of the Democrats. No, it's not. It's the fault of the Republicans. And and there are going to be some people, who, friends of mine, who will suggest that maybe it's the other way around. Maybe the Republicans co-opted the Democrats. But they, but there was there was a mm-hmm. time there was a time that uh, that really the new guy. On the block, whether they whether their heritage was from the the Big Five or from the Democratic Party, the new guys on the block came to an accommodation with each other, you know, and, and they sort of started to to look at things in, in a kind of a Hawaii way, uh, mm. uh, you know. So you can see, like, uh, you know, Kenny Brown, for example, he he played a real strong role in Kenny Brown getting these guys to sort of get together. I mean, you know, where was uh, Stuart Ho? Stuart Ho, we talked about uh, Walter Dodds. Walter was actually kind of the younger generation coming up. Right. But Stuart Ho, which was uh, his father, was one of the first big time Democratic uh, developers in Hawaii. All of a sudden can get together with a um, Johnny Ballinger, who was an up from coming, probably Republican background, but they were more interested in getting things done. So I think that what people may not have realized that someday somebody might write a book about it is how close knit the establishment in Hawaii on some respect were. When a Tommy Trask who ran the ILW could call his cousin who ran the HGA, who could call a fellow uh, Hawaiian, uh, there are three of them right there called Johnny Ballinger, and called uh, Colin uh, Ca- uh, Cannon, Colin Cameron, and the banks and labor unions would get together and say, you know what, 
I, I think we ought to make sure that when this 1978 Constitutional Convention comes along, uh, we shouldn't have initiative referendum recall. They didn't call it us. I mean, we were already headed in that direction, but they were starting to do things like that. Um, the closest thing we have like that today might be uh, what you see with the Hawaii Executive Council, where people have started getting business, labor, and everybody together. But back then, it was the boys calling the boys, you know, and uh, and uh, seeing what happened. Well, the initiative and, initiative and referendum were, uh, by their they, by their very definition, were uncontrollable, and that's why they were something that the different groups of good old boys would, did not want, and why they were such a thing that was not going to fly at the at the constitutional convention. It was just too unpredictable. Yeah, and and and, and, and the convention itself also also created a, a, a number of leaders that popped out of it, you know, Jeremy Harris. Jeremy Harris. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, Carol Fukunaga, Tom Okamura, you know, all of these people came out of the convention. Let but me... Jeremy... Oh, go ahead, Jer Governor. No, I was going to say, Jeremy was a special case because he was actually from Kauai. And then he moved to Honolulu to work with Frank Bossy, and he ended up being there. Here, he couldn't get elected. Kauai, but he got elected in the We we only have about six minutes left, and I want to ask you about two characters who we haven't talked about, who have very big personalities in politics in this state, um, and that's Ben Cayetano and Neil Abercrombie. Where where did they fit into this, you know, uh, into the factions you were discussing earlier, and what what how did their brands emerge? Because they both had very distinctive brands, I think. Well, from my point of view, I, I guess if you wanted to like chart, chart, uh, you know, chart their political genealogy, they would have been on the, the Gill side. But I don't mm -hmm. know if any of them actually campaigned for Gill or did anything for Gill. But they, they came in under that faction because they were with Dickie Wong. And they all got together with Dickie. But Ben, you know, Ben is was always Ben. I I I don't know him as any different. Think, he, go ahead, Rich. I was going to say I was going to I was going to say that that I think uh, history is going to be very kind to Ben Cayetano uh, because he was able to move so many different things. Uh, for instance, when the Star Bulletin was going to be closed. It was Ben Cayetano who was able to uh, tell the attorney general to sue and to keep uh, keep the Star Bulletin around so that it could be revived and then bought by David Black in, in Canada, which is a, a major a major thing. It was going to be a one newspaper town with the one editorial voice, and it's now the a one newspaper town with a bifurcated editorial voice uh, between the advertiser and the Star Bulletin groups in it. Uh, I think that that uh, uh, Ben Cayetano is going to also did a lot for in other areas, including Bishop Estate. It was his his instrumentality that pushed forward the lawsuits in Bishop Estate, and that. He's going to have a, a a good biography, I think. And and Neil Neil has his own story to tell too. And you know, I I, I Neil was um, we we often give a, a lot of credit to Danny Noy as he deserves it, and he deserves it well deserved. But a lot of things that Danny did in Washington would not have been possible without the support that that Neil provided. I mean, one of the key things, for example, when Dan Akaka, who was a senator for a long time, introduced the bill on Hawaiian, uh, on Native Hawaiian federal recognition, he uh, yeah, he was never able to get it out of the Senate. Neil got it out of the House three times, including when there was a Republican leadership. So, which is the reason why I begged him <laughs> not to run for governor. You know, don't want to stick around. You're going to, one of these days, we're going to get the majority back again, and you're going to become a very powerful chairman. Uh, and, and, you know, the 
I tell you one thing that Neil has, did when he was uh, governor, which I think had a lasting impact on Hawaii, was the uh, people that he appointed to the Supreme Court. I think that with people, uh, the, the court took, uh, became the most, I don't know where you, where you put it on the spectrum, but became the most progressive after uh, since uh, Richardson, C.J. Richardson, mm -hmm. with people like Mike Wilson and, uh, and, and, and the other colleagues. So they, I think they won't, Christian's going to be uh, kind of- Well, and, and Neil, Neil, let's not forget that Neil really went totally all out on the line uh, for same-sex marriage. Uh, and it made, there was a special session for it. I, we many of us got to go to the signing. We were so proud of him. And I mean, for all you want to say about Neil, um, if he had a belief, he, he lived it, and and you could always sense that around him. Oh, and since you're talking about same-sex marriage, I don't want to miss out uh, and not mention Justice Levinson, uh -huh. who I appointed, who wrote the decision that changed America. You know, and uh, just so just so we can. Get, equalize some of this progressives. <laughs> I think it's his birthday today, Steve Levinson. Oh, really? Steve it is? Levinson. Yeah. Well, good. So anyway, we haven't mentioned any Doug. We haven't. Well, this is our last chance. We have a minute. So Governor, I'll turn it over to you. Are there any duds we didn't cover? Steve Cobb. Mm. Steve Cobb. Uh, in my opinion, uh, you know, he because he he always associated himself with good government, and and at the end, that whole thing blew up. You know, he got arrested. Was, I, I don't want to go. He, and and uh, just to chime in real quickly, it's beyond dud. It, it's a disaster. But the Kealohas, uh, Catherine and Louis, and and the the besmirching of the public trust by them. They were both Absolutely. in high places. They were both in high places. They were a wonderful Hawaii Honolulu couple, and they drove it into the ground and uh, made a mess of it all. And shame on them. Well, that is our time for today um, on our encore performance of uh, Heroes, Rascals, and Duds. Thank you all for for being here on uh, uh, Talk Story with John Waihe. I was happy to be the the guest host. Um, and I've learned an enormous amount over the last hour. So thanks for sharing all these terrific stories. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.